Hebrews chapter 6, yes. verses 9 through 20. Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 9. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we're convinced of better things in your case. Yes. The things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherited what has been promised. Yeah. When God made his promise to Abraham, yeah. since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope, this hope. as an anchor for the soul, yeah, yeah. firm and secure. secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever. Ever. In the order of Melchizedek, we live in an era of unkept promises. The certainty of God's promises. Certainty. That's good. Nations sign That's important good. treaties and documents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they break them all the time. All the time. Many couples stand before the preacher and make promises or vows. To one another and we see that they show little regard for those wedding vows yeah, yeah. in this kind of society we who are God's children God's people should be known for keeping our promises yeah. the brilliant Christian scholar and writer C.S. Lewis tells in his biography of the determination that he showed towards one of his buddies who was with him in World War I. Yes, sir. His biography tells of the suffering he went through because he made a promise to his buddy on the battlefield. Yeah. The friend was worried about what was going to happen to his wife and daughter if he were to die while on the battlefield. And C.S. Lewis told him, you don't have to worry. If I make it out, I'll take care of your family. Wow. True to his word, the young man he made the promise to did die in the war of World War I. And he went to take care and provide for the wife and the daughter. And yet, no matter how helpful he tried to be yeah, yeah. with this wife and daughter, the wife rejected yeah. The wife turned against him. The wife was ungrateful, rude, arrogant, and domineering. And in spite of all of her mannerism and her ways, C.S. Lewis kept, kept. His, word. kept his word. He refused Excuse. to let her actions become an excuse to renege on his promise. Yeah. 
God's promises are like that. Yeah. And they are unfailing. unfailing. He promised in Hebrew 13 and 5, I will always be with you. Yes, sir. In Isaiah 41 and 10, he tells us, do not fear for I am with you. Yes. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Matthew 11, 28 and 29, he talks to me. He says, come unto me, yeah, yeah. all you who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Yeah, yeah. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, yeah. and he is, and he is humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Yes, sir. The whole letter to the Hebrews offers encouragement to believers on this Christian journey. Yes. Knowing that difficulties await us at every turn. Yes, if you ever find yourself struggling to keep pressing on as a believer, or you're overwhelmed by doubts, or if you become sluggish in responding to the trials that will come your way. Or you might be even tempted to throw in the towel and say that no, it ain't worth it. No, I don't have time for this. Then this section of Hebrews yes, sir. is just for you. Me, this on. letter will give you words of encouragement, words of hope to keep fighting on no matter what obstacle might stand in my way. All of us at some time or another, yes, sir. be for real with me now, Come every on. now and then you get discouraged. Yeah. Every now and then you get doubting in your mind. Yeah. Every that's now right. and then you want to question and challenge God on the stuff that's going on in your life. But we have to maintain our hope Maintain our courage knowing that God got this thing. I heard of a picture of an old burned out mountain shack. All that remained was the fire extinguisher, the chimney that was there. It had burned down and then standing in front on the picture was a grandfather with his son. The grandfather only had his underclothes on and the young man was just standing there holding a pair of overalls. It was evident that the child was crying. Beneath the picture were the words which the artist felt the old man was speaking to the boy. They were simple words, yeah. yet they presented a profound theological statement. He said to the little boy, hush child, God ain't dead. That vivid picture of that burned out mountain shack, that old man and that little boy crying, and those words, God ain't dead. Instead of us, instead of it being a reminder of the despair of life, this picture has come to be a reminder of hope. We all need reminders that there is hope in this world. In the midst of all of life's troubles and failures, we need some idea, some mental picture that everything is going to be all right. In spite of what looks like 45 going back into office, in spite of what it looks like with 45 being able to run for president and a convicted felon, in spite of the wars and the rumors of wars all around the world, we have a God that ain't dead. We have a God that's still in control. And as long as God is alive and in control of this world, I'm not worried. I know that everything is going to be all right. After reading the first part of chapter 6 with words of warning, now beginning in the ninth verse, 
are words of encouragement. He begins in verse 9 by saying, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. You're struggling. You're going through stuff. But there are better things in store for you. He encourages them not to give up. To move on to maturity and not become sluggish in their faith. He reminds them of the value of faithfulness. By holding out the example of Abraham yeah. in both patience and service. Lord, give me some more patience. Yeah. He reminds them that God gives us the promise of a blessing and has sworn an oath to support his word. A promise made by God who cannot lie was designed to give comfort and encouragement to those of us who are struggling believers. One of the greatest dangers facing us is to lose sight of the basis of our hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. So to remedy this danger, our writer reminds us of the promises of God. And this morning I want to share three things that are available to each one of us. And I know you already know all of this. I know you already got it down. Come on. I know you already doing it. Help us today. Help but first, we have the profound comfort of the person of God. Yeah, Verse 18 speaks of two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. The word immutable means fixed, unalterable, can't be changed. It's stuck right there. Ain't nothing going to change it. Examples of the use of this word were used in ancient writings as a technical term in connection with the will. In other words, the will cannot be altered.
But he continued in faithfulness, believing that God was going to deliver because God is faithful to accomplish what he has promised. And we too are to be encouraged and looking and believing that God is going to deliver on the promises that he has given us. First, we have the comfort of the person of God, and then we have the comfort of the promise of God in verses 16 through 18. Since God's promise is trustworthy, it was not necessary for God to make an oath. Yeah, come on. Omnipotent. Yeah, come on. Omnipresent. Yeah, yeah. Um, all knowing. Yeah, yeah. God didn't need <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but for man, yeah, for man, his oath simply confirms and should strengthen the promises that he made. Who is greater than God? No one. You know how kids be in the playground at school. I swear on my mama grave. I swear on my grandmama. I ain't. I'm not. They tell me that all the time. I. I yeah. Well. Uh huh. Since no one is greater, he swore by himself, confirming his promise. God did. God swearing an oath was a condescension to human frailty, thus making his word, which in itself is absolutely trustworthy and doubly dependable. The believer's hope then is grounded in the absolute dependability yeah, yeah. of God's word. word. Yeah. What kind of hope do we have? Woo. Romans 8 and 24 speaks of a saving hope. First Peter 1 and 3, it's called a living hope. Living. Titus 1 and 2, it's yeah. a secure hope. Secure. First Thessalonians 1 and 3, it's a patient, patient. hope. Woo. In Colossians 1 and 27, it's a glorious hope. In Romans 15 and 13, it is a hope that abounds. In Titus 2 and 13, it is a blessed hope. Yeah. We find in 1 John 3 and 3, that it is a purifying hope. Yeah. God did this so that by two immutable qualities, yeah. we would have confidence yes, in his word. That's good. Verse 18b is a picture of the cities of refuge in Numbers 35, where people could flee from calamity or some fearful judgment. The law was basically an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But a kinsman was expected to avenge the death of a relative. Uh -huh. However, if there was an accidental killing, you could go to this city of refuge where you would be safe until he could stand trial. If you went outside the city, you had no protection. The sinner in his sin is in grave danger because of our sin. The wages of sin is death and separation from God. Sin places us under the death penalty. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we flee to Jesus we find in him a refuge yeah, yeah. we find in him a safe place we lay hold of the hope that brings forgiveness salvation and cleansing hope what an encouragement what a comfort we have in Jesus the believers hope is a comfort for the soul God could no, go no higher than himself. Yeah, yeah. He promised, and he's got to keep his promise. Yes. He's got to do what he has claimed and proclaimed yet that he would do. Yes, the Lord worked on Abraham's behalf, 
gave him great encouragement to put his hope in a divine promise and could to continue to press on. Yeah. But even more so, God has resolved to give you greater encouragement so that you might not give up. But the promise made is only as valuable as the one who makes it. So we are meant to be encouraged for it is God who makes the promise and it's impossible for God to lie. Yes, hmm. Hmm. My God, my God. Then we have the profound comfort of the presence of God. We have the profound comfort of the promise of God. We have the profound comfort of the person of God. We have hope as an anchor of the soul, which is sure and steadfast. It's grounded in the promise and the oath of God. It comforts the soul, and it is certain. That's why the Christian can declare blessed assurance, yes. Jesus is mine. Yes. That's why the Christian can say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Yes. It's a hope that's laid up in heaven. It is a blessed hope that one day Jesus will come again and take us to be with him forever. Today, some may say, I hope that I am saved. This speaks of the uncertainty and the doubt. My hope is anchored not to the ocean floor, but in heaven itself. Sometimes sandbars are across the entrance to a port. It makes it impossible for large vessels to enter the port at low tide. So a sailor or a forerunner would take the anchor from the boat, go across the sandbars, and put the anchor down so that the ship would be secure and would not move. It would be steady and safe. And when the tide rises, the boat is high enough above the sandbar to cross over into the port. Jesus, the forerunner, has entered into the harbor, yeah, the yeah, heavenly yeah. of heavenlies. There he makes intercession for his people still on earth. His presence is there. Their assurance that he's going to keep his promise and it's going to be kept is there. He's taken the anchor with him behind the veil. His people are on earth like a cargo laden ship and must stay in the open sea, battering by the winds, battered by the storms, yeah. but they are held fast and sure as they go on bearing the precious cargo of God's redemptive world mission. In due time, God's tide will rise yeah. and they will enter into the heavenly harbor bringing a cargo of souls with them. Woo. This hope, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure, steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. He gives three descriptions of this anchor. He says it is sure, and the word implies it is outwardly safe. There is nothing that can topple the believer's hope. Paul said it best in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded yeah. that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, yeah. nor height, nor death, nor any other created being can keep me from the love of Christ Jesus. Yes. We are safe That's with right. the anchor of hope. We are also steadfast. This yeah. points to the inward stability of this anchor of hope that is firm within us. Mm. In other words, there is no weakness in hope, 
as the anchor of the soul. We do not have to concern ourselves with hope going bankrupt or encountering a scandal of some sort. It is thoroughly established and firm. Yes. And the third description of hope as the soul's anchor demonstrates the place where the anchor has been placed. An anchor grabs the ocean bottom. But my anchor is not at the ocean bottom. My anchor is in heaven. My anchor enters into the veil. It's the scene of the high priest who can only enter the Holy of Holies once a year, yeah. and that with the sacrifice of the sins of Israel. He trembled as entering because he knew he was not worthy to be there. And once his duty was done, he immediately left and went out from behind the veil. Yeah. But that is not the case ah. with our anchor of hope. It is firmly anchored in heaven on one end and firmly attached to the believer's soul on the other end. Yes. An anchor does not do any good if it is solely hooked to the ocean floor but not tied to a boat. Yes. Our anchor of the soul is fixed securely in our lives through the work of Jesus Christ. Wonderful. And the pool at the other end is within the veil the eternal security in the presence of the Lord. Yes. Jesus is there as the one who went before us as our forerunner. Yes. He's the one who is holding and anchoring my place yes. and anchoring my position. And here is what he wants you to understand. Yes. We will be where Christ is within the veil for he has gone before us to prepare a place that we might be with him forever. Yes. In fact, he left us a message in John 14, 2 and 3. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Yes. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Yes. We first have the profound comfort of the person of God, yes. then we have the comfort of the promise of God, promise. then we have the comfort of the presence of God. Presence. There is a story told that a medical director was approached by a young man. The young man had a new doctor come in to see him. Yes. And the new doctor told him that you know you don't have any hope you know there's no cure for your illness. Yes. There's no way you're going to make it out of here before the year is out. As the young man left, he stopped by the director's desk yes. and wept and told him, that man took away my hope. My God. I guess he did, replied the doctor. Maybe it's time for you to find a new one. My Lord. Is there a hope? when hope is taken away? Is there hope when the situation is hopeless? That's the question that will lead us to Christian hope. For it is in the Bible that we find that hope is no longer a passion for the possible. Yes. It becomes a passion for the promise. We're living, I tell you, in difficult days. Yes. Sometimes the storms can almost take us under and smash us to pieces. Yes. In times like these, I need a savior. In times like these, I need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, be very sure that your anchor holds to that solid rock. That solid rock is Jesus. He's the one who came through. He's the one who came. He's the one who came and suffered for you and for me. He's the one who walked these dusty streets, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. He's the one that walked on water. He's the one that turned water into wine. He's the one who went all the way to Calvary. 
beaten and battered beyond recognition. He's the one who went to that grave, but he didn't stay in that grave. There Friday night, there Saturday night, but early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. He got up with all power to convince us that he would keep his word. I'm here to tell you this morning, God ain't dead. He's still in control. I'm here to tell you this morning that he's going to keep his promises. The promise that he made to you and to me. We've just got to hold on. We've got to hold on and be patient. We've got to hold on and be faithful. We've got to hold on to his unchanging hand. Where does your hope lie? My God. If your anchor is in the world, it's going to come loose. It's not going to be able to hold. When storms are raging, when trouble is all around you, you won't be able to hold. Hold on. But if your anchor is in Christ, your anchor, your anchor. If your promise is in him, if your faith is in him, oh God. he will Hold on. deliver. He will bring you through. There may be one here this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Though the storms keep on raging in my life, and sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day. Still that hope that lies within is reassured. You can come. As I keep my eyes upon that distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. But if, if the storms don't cease, and if, if the winds Keeps blowing in my life. My soul's been, been anchored in, in the Lord. Though the storms keep on raging in my life. And sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day. Still that hope that lies within yes. is reassured. As I keep my eyes upon that distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. But if, if the storms don't cease, and if, if the winds Keep on blowing in my life. My soul, it's been anchored in in the Lord. I realize. That sometimes in this life we're gonna be tossed 
by the waves and the currents that seem so fierce but in the word of God I've, yeah. I've got an anchor and it keeps me steadfast and unmovable despite the tide but if, if the storms just don't cease and just in case the winds yeah just keep on blowing blowing in my life my soul's been it's been anchored in in the Lord yes my soul's been anchored my soul's been anchored my soul's been anchored my soul's been anchored the world been anchored yes my soul's been anchored the Romans may rise the winds may blow but I tell you he holds me fast my soul's been anchored my soul's been anchored yes my soul's been anchored my soul's been anchored my soul's been anchored my soul's been anchored Yes, the storms may rise, the winds may blow. Yes. But I tell you that he holds me fast because my soul's been anchored. Woo. My soul's been anchored. My soul's been anchored. My soul's been anchored. My soul's been anchored. In the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. We've done as the Lord has commanded. There will always be room in our Father's kingdom. This time we receive our tithes and offering. <coughs> will a man rise?